Hello? Hi. I'm Paul. Uh, I have a few announcements to make before the lecture. The first announcement is our annual career fair is next Wednesday from March 16th at 12 noon, or at, on March 16th, not from March 16th. One day event. March 16th from 12 noon to 3 p.m. here, room 1100. We're expecting 15 firms to participate. Uh, number two, in preparation for the career fair, now that you know about that, there's a group of alumni from our A3, which is UIC's Architectural Alumni Association or organization and association, which has organized a career fair free game this Wednesday, March 9th, right after studio at 6 p.m. Rather than this is from them, rather than talk about formatting your resume or portfolio, the group thought it would be a good idea to offer advice on how to navigate the speed dating atmosphere of a career fair. So they'll offer tips on how to make a connection with a prospective employer when you only have a couple of minutes. This one's good. All right, I have prepared remarks. Um, welcome to the Spring 2016 Lecture Series here at the School of Architecture. I'm Paul, um, as I said. Uh, tonight's talker, Peter Zellner, is principal of Zellner and Acker Architects in Los Angeles and faculty at the Southern California Institute of Architecture. He's taught at the University of Southern California, the University of Innsbruck, served as the Ivan H. Smith M. Chair in Architecture at the University of Florida, and was the Freeman Fellow at the University of California. His writings have appeared in Architects newspaper, Domus, the New York Times, Law, Forum, Harvard Design Magazine, and a lot of other places, both scholarly and commercial sorts. Uh, if you aren't yet familiar with Big Peter, you're surely familiar with some of the effects of Peter, uh, whether you like them or don't. Uh, this is mostly as a result of his canonical book, Hybrid Space, published in 1999, which identified uh, and to some degree commodified the formal and organizational experiments with computer-made space that a number of young practices uh, were working with at the end of the 20th century. This book made familiar work that at the time was rather obscure and certainly not by any means popular at the time. Uh, he followed this work up in 2003 with a smaller publication and exhibition at Artist Space in New York City titled Sign is Surface, which looked, well, which looked at, well, was arranged around two competing tendencies, uh, practices committed to representation and metaphor, uh, and those concerning themselves with material systems and their organization. He then made a lot of people annoyed by retiring from curating other people's ambitions uh, and kind of started his own office, Elman Plus, and found himself kind of out of the club when his interest in the vaguely familiar and artist practices of Southern California and Mexico developed into a body of theoretical and notebook which had no interest in, the advance, in advancing the complicated digital technological tendencies being exhibited by his peers and instead produced a range of gallery, museum, and domestic spaces privileged the strange, weird world of our popular culture. Projects like Matthew Mark's gallery, which he used to put a variety of white box uh, in such a subnormal way that it created kind of a black hole in the space right in front of you, uh, although with a door, uh, and a door that seemed like a kind David Lynch would use to make you quite nervous about what's in it. Uh, also, the haphazard gallery walls and dirty spaces that were created in night gallery makes even the art on it. $40,000 foreign paintings meant to not only infer offense but feel a little bit illicit. Uh, then, after making 20 some projects in this manner and putting up with the derision of his regional peers, he couldn't quite understand the word. Uh, and having developed a clear and profound throat about the possible nature of a more free and artful type of architecture, he closed up the shop and took a job as a principal and studio lead at the publicly traded American worldwide provider of professional tech services and management support services to a broad range of markets, including infrastructure, transportation, facilities, environmental, energy, water, and government that we all know as ACOM. Uh, this confused just about everyone. Then he proceeded to make ACOM a bit more weird, too, involved them in work with art attitudes that did nothing less than run our national design awards and make people think that this plan company might just be interesting after all. Uh, and then he left. And now he's here with a new partnership, uh, but still I hope pursuing small interests that get scaled up to architecture, and then investigate the possibilities for social space, domestic activity, public identity, and urban forms that never quite feel like they're really anything 
of significance at first, but result in a set of disturbing and provocative and profound architectural attractions. Uh, so with that all said, I'm very uh, excited to be able to welcome Peter Zellner to the School of Architecture.
relationship between colonial and European cultures. And, and he was a critic, so he was a kind of critic of what happened with Allende in, in Chile. And later he, uh, he became very involved with supporting um, both what you know, occurred in, in Cuba in the 1960s and later in, in Nicaragua in the 70s and 80s. And, and at the end of his career, he moved quite radically away from the position of being a kind of uh, an elitist artist commenting you know, about his, you know, his culture in Latin America from Paris, where he could enjoy great art and coffee and, and, and really focus on his artistry as a tremendous writer because you should kind of pick up the book if you want to. Um, and he committed at a late in life to going to Nicaragua, going to Cuba, and actually beginning to sort of directly document things in a journalistic way um, because he believed that, that he, was, he was time to engage. So this is a really interesting quote. Uh, he's talking about living in Europe. And he says, the slow, absorbing, infinite, and egotistic traffic of beauty and culture. Life on a continent where a few hours put me in front of a fresco by Giotto or a Velasquez or the Prado, or in those London galleries where the paintings of Turner seem to lean at that light. The daily temptation to return, as in other days, to a total feverish absorption in intellectual and aesthetic problems, to lofty games of thought and imagination, to creativity with no other finality than the pleasure of the intellect or the senses. All this sense often be an internal battle with the feeling that none of this justified if at the same time it's not open to the vital problems. So it's, it's an interesting statement from an author who really focuses himself mostly on the craft of writing, but at a certain point realizes that to write means to comment. And, and he moves from believing that the book is something that starts in reality and ends in the book to understanding that the book starts as a book and moves to reality. So maybe that's a little bit of what we can try to do. Um, so as Paul noted, I, you know, uh, new pra practice, I have a partner who's a tremendous architect, spent many years working uh, in this part of the world in St. Louis with HOK and, and uh, previously KPF and, and we met at this big company and decided to leave uh, and to try something very different. And so the challenge for us now is to figure out how to be effective, which I think is what a lot of big companies are good at doing, uh, while making meaningful work. And when we say meaningful work, we mean work that is meaningful for us, for our clients, and, and hopefully for the world. Um, you know, without sounding too lofty, I think we're in a very interesting moment in our history culturally, in which there are conversations around, um, you know, really what we described in the culture as the culture wars of the 90s are back. And it is interesting to see ideology more than ever. <coughs> in the media, and to see the sort of um, presence of, uh, let's say, image making and um, bombastic speech uh, contrasted with objective conversations about how to do things practically. So and I think that was very evident the other night uh, in Flint, Michigan. So it's an interesting framework for us to think about what we do as architects right now. Um, I've become increasingly interested in, in, in ways in which the work engage in both social, and economic, and cultural problems, and at the same time maintain its authority as a, as a, as a verifiable aesthetic act. And, and I truly believe that it is possible for us <coughs> to make things that are artful and that are also politically, culturally, and economically meaningful. And that sounds kind of very high polluting, but you know, I had a very interesting conversation the other week in Mexico City with an artist named Wally Pesci. While it is a pretty well-known maker of, of uh, everything from video to installations and sculpture, and he's become quite wealthy doing this. He's a sort of artist star now. He showed in Venice last year. So we were with my students, and one of my students is quite uh, rambunctious, is kind of attacked and said, "You know, you make art, dude. We were having drinks, but you're pretty rich, and you're a rich artist, and I'm a starving architect. And how do you justify having so much money?" And Wally, you know, took it on the head pretty well. He said, look, what I do and what I make makes me money. But what I do and what I make is probably a print or a piece of sculpture or maybe a video. But I'm not fucking up the world like you guys are. And so we might have the whole architect or artist there. But his point was, you know, we can pretend we're artists, and I think a lot of architects would like to be artists. But at the end of the day, you know, the net impact of his work on the world is probably, I'm going to get sued for this, not as significant as a global infrastructure companies, right? So, you know, if, you, if we get it wrong, 
things go wrong. I think if an artist gets it wrong, maybe it's an interesting, you know, uh, conversation. So, with that, all right, I'll just finish those projects. I'll, I'll go through these quickly. So, as Paul noted, you know, for several years I had a small practice. These are three projects that we finished between 2011 and, and 2014 when I closed shop. Um, two are galleries and one's a house. Uh, one's a freestanding building on the left, the other is basically a series of objects inside, organized inside an existing warehouse, and the house was really the first uh, ground up domestic space um, developed in the studio. Uh, I'm going to do something tonight for you guys because I, I think sometimes we professionals lie to you students about the fact that we look at things, and so um, this is a little bit like a magician just showing you things that, that you do behind the scenes to kind of make your work. And so I'm going to show you all of my references. I'm going to show you all the tricks. And hopefully you find that interesting. This is a photograph by Lewis Baltz um, of a series of industrial tracks. Uh, he did a beautiful book called Some Industrial Tracks in California in 1970. It's part of this kind of uh, new geographies, photography that was influenced by uh, like the Beckers and other you know, German like, hyper photo realists. Uh, he did very indexable work. And I, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to meet Mr. Baltz in Paris in 99, and I've always been deeply influenced by his quite tragic photographs of the American industrial landscape. So, with that, here's the site it's in West Hollywood, um, sort of a liminal site on an alley. Uh, there's a at the bottom, you guys probably can't see it there, but there's a very long elevation which shows the palm tree and what in the end was some collaboration between myself and, and Mr. Ellsworth Kelly, who just passed away. Really uh, amazing. Um, opportunity to work with a great American artist, uh, and we made a, a kind of a, a strange little insertion into the valley landscape. That's the end product at day and at night. It's got a 12 foot high, 4 foot wide uh, door that, that does a little bit of a, a wee monument thing, uh, a la spinal cap. It's a very odd thing to sort of be with because it, it, does, it, it doesn't register at the appropriate scale. Um, so, these are very simple kind of studies that were done after the project was completed. And what you're seeing is uh, a square project room with a large oblong um, gallery. Uh, and then some service stuff in the little bars, like the toilet in the front of the house. Uh, one thing that is interesting in having done about 25 galleries is that um, the contrast between these two projects has to do with how the public uses the gallery and also receives art. So this is a blue chip gallery, this is Matthew Marks. One thing that happens to most of us when we go into a gallery is we're very intimidated, right? Because there is some very icy, dramatic person sitting behind a desk, right? And you have to pass that kind of examination to get to the art. And for many of us, that's, you know, it's not fun. So it's easier to go to a museum, pay some money, go see some art, put on your, you know, your walkman or whatever you use these days, uh, and engage in art that way. A lot of art galleries are points of sale, essentially, so they're a little bit like going into a luxury store. Either you feel comfortable purchasing the Louis Vuitton bag, or you feel very uncomfortable when that person has come and asked you four times, uh, what, are you, you know, what are you looking for? And at some point, you walk out because you know you're not, uh, you know, you're probably not able to afford the product. And that's unfortunate what happens in a lot of galleries. Mark, Matthew yeah, Marks is no exception. You do have to kind of pass the, the, the test in the front of the gallery. So, um, it is structured to produce an engagement with art that is nearly religious. And so it's all top lit, it's naturally lit, uh, and it was designed um, primarily for really important pieces of art. And most of the art shown uh, is by American masters. And interestingly, most of it's not sold in LA, it's sold in New York, it's pre sold. So there's this very interesting idea of making the space for art in which the transaction never happens. So the, the gallery actually, uh, Tricks of the Trade, was kind of made to give New York artists an opportunity to have their first gallery show, which then leads to a show at LACMA or at MoMA. And, and so I, you know, I'm very interested in the kind of strategies and politics and how the art world works. They're, they're, they're easier to read and, and far less confusing than architecture, mostly because we artists can't get our shit together. But you know, art is a business, and um, it's you know for some of these galleries, they're very well run businesses. So the client was tremendously precise about things like how high wall should be. We would have debates about 4, 12, 14, 16, 18 foot. And you know, Matthew said interesting stuff like that. If he had his druthers, he would make all the walls 
eight foot, because the majority of collectors only have eight foot high walls in their apartments. And if you give artists the unfortunate opportunity to make work on a 16 foot wall, you do it, and then you're stuck trying to pedal that stuff to museums, which is part of the stuff. So I, I, you know, I'm very fascinated and specifically about the fact that art is openly dealt with. I mean, Warhol said, you know, the business of art is business. I like the fact that the art world, the idea that aesthetics are commodified, um, is open and shared, and it allows people to compete in a meaningful way. I think in architecture, quite often, we're all very confused about the fact that our work is commodified, and so some of us think we're making art, but we're competing with people regularly who are making business. And recently, we were on a short list for a museum in Los Angeles, and we found ourselves on the list with the usual suspects, uh, Kulapat, uh, Edwin Chan, um, and Gensler. And you know, at a certain point, you're like, why are you here? But that's the market we're working in now. Everybody says that they can do art and culture now, including the big shops. So, so I think the world's changing in that sense. It's harder and harder to sort of operate as a, as a boutique practitioner when you have larger organizations kind of gotten up from the top down. And I have a kind of thesis that what's happening in our profession is that we're bifurcating now, and so we have a split between monoliths, which are 650 person offices, and the 30 to 40 to 60 person offices that used to exist in like, people like Harry Beast, and they either get sucked up into the monster or the offices break apart into smaller shops. But the smaller shops are either convinced that they can do very specific consulting, so I only do galleries, therefore I'm a gallery expert, that's my niche. Or I'm only an academic architect and I make, you know, I make books, I make ex exhibition installations, and I survive essentially by teaching. And that's perfectly fine and I think an ethically positive position. But the reality is if you're a small shop now and you want to make work in the world, you're competing with organizations that are more empowered, more enabled, have more people, have more technology than you are, and they're coming into your neighborhood and your block and offering their services. So what Paul and I have been trying to figure out essentially is how to survive. Um, and how to take advantage of the fact that being small is potentially powerful. And we haven't figured that out. So we're working on it. But it's, it's a work in process. But you know, we don't want to be out of business or not making work in five years. We want to be thriving. Um, but we want to do it with a different model. And we think it's a different cultural model. We also think it's a different economic model. We're not interested in exploiting our employees. So, you know, very pointedly for us, having a shop that runs off the labor of young people have $250,000 in debt in year five, it's just not an acceptable position. We want to pay people equitably, and we want to figure out a way, and I know it sounds kind of crazy, to do that in the context of having essentially a small business. So that's kind of what we think about these days. And I know it sounds a bit you know, uh, dumb to talk about, but the reality is I think 20 years ago, if you were, I don't know, Tom or Frank Gehry, the, the economics of making architecture were very different. Rents were cheaper, there was more work, licensure was easier. So these are all really exciting things, by the way. I'm not putting these out there to terrify any of you. I think that for your generation, these are the interesting challenges because if we all believe we want to make great architecture, and I'm assuming that's why we're all here, we have to figure this out. And um, it's incumbent on us, I think, to move the work into the world. So, like artists do. By the way, that was uh, Tony Smith. I was really happy about how the figure of River Spitter Ground works here in the, uh, in the plan. All right, so with all, I'm going to get done with all this sort of, you know, bemoaning the state of architecture uh, nonsense and, and just talk about composition a little bit. Um, strangely enough, after we analyzed uh, the facade here for, for Matthew Marks, we found out that it worked out kind of uh, golden means. Strangely. Anyhow. Uh, Tally made a painting in 1966 called Black Over White. And we agreed to turn that into a building. And so the building, actually, strangely enough, was actually approved as a piece of art. Um, that's partially how we got through some of the zoning challenges. This is the installation of the panel, it weighs about 4,000 pounds. It went onto the white box, beautifully um, installed by uh, Peter Carlson Associates. They do a lot of Jeff Koons work. Um, pretty fascinating to see how these guys work very quickly. The thing was hung in like 12 minutes. So these guys have the detail that like, you would not believe. Uh, and there's something to that, right? When you meet a group of art and scholars, you can put something together at scale that's 40 feet wide and 80 feet high and weighs 4,000 pounds. When you find people who put that together and hang it off 16 big points, that's, that's skill. And so I think we can learn a lot, basically, from aligned industries that are making things in the world in environments that um, are demanding. Um, 
But remember, get paid really well to do it, right? So that's Matthew Marks. So you know, after I did Matthew Marks, um, sort of decided I didn't want to do art galleries anymore because it's kind of like maybe the best thing I thought I could ever do. And um, then had a very interesting invitation from two young galleries, one artist and, and a dealer, Mika Marble and David Emeroff, to have a look at a warehouse space on the east side of downtown, in a rough neighborhood. Uh, they said, would you work with us? We don't have any money. Um, I said, the money's not the issue. I just I want a free hand. So it was a very interesting point, personally, where I was willing to make that sacrifice. But oh, there's the there's the sleight of hand. So remember that. I'm sure you know who it is. Uh, so they, they gave me a free hand. One thing I said is like, look, you know, I don't want to make a gallery. I'm going back to Matthew Marks that has a front of house and a back of house and a storage area that's you know uh, not open to the public. So we came up with, and I think it's it's quite interesting, a plan in which everybody can access the back of the house. And Kind of flow around the gallery without any kind of securitized relationship to the artist. So if you go visit my gallery, uh, Mika and Danita would encourage you to go see where they store their art, where they have all their beer. You can take a beer and walk out if you wish. But this is a gallery by artists for artists. And the, the history of my gallery, which is interesting, is that they started with a fundamental inversion. And uh, the inversion was that most galleries are open here today. They have their first gallery in a former uh, taco stand, strip mall in Lincoln Heights, uh, and they opened at 8 and they closed at 8. So you went basically for the art at night, that's why it's called Night Gallery. And you also went for the opportunity to be with you know, uh, like minded artists. So when it really started, it was an amazing scene. It was kind of LA's more recent version of Andy's Factory. You could kind of meet anybody and anybody there. Might be an artist or might not, with people kind of wandering off the streets. So we tried to replicate that in the form of a white box gallery. And the, the thought was that you could create a space that promoted um, unpredictable social interactions. And it's kind of work. I mean, they do a comedy night, which is pretty fun. They do like an art comedy night, which is tremendous. The jokes suck. But, um, but they have all these kind of alternate ways of programming the space. Of course, I had it shot in my career with Steam Wing. But, but usually it's pretty messy and rambunctious. So if you come to LA, you should attend my gallery. Yan Hee Min is a friend and an artist who did a beautiful um, series of, of painted windows uh, just with spray cans. And, and her work casts uh, quite an otherworldly um, hue on the otherwise kind of boring white boxes that we do as architects. That's it at night. Super cheap way of kind of getting a great effect at night. Uh, and I think that's also why I find when so influenced and in love with many artists is that they come up with solutions that work in you know, the time and space that they have to do. And this took her like, I don't know, half a day. You know, it would take me probably six months to think about it, the options, you do the green or the blue, no, let's render it, let's make a video of it, let's make a full scale mock up, right? Make a full scale mock up because we can't do it. Uh, all right, so, um, but they just do it, which is kind of nice. You just get on with it. All right, House in Tijuana. Uh, do you guys know the reference? Who knows the reference? Oh, man. Frank Beardy Silver. There you go. Dance at your house. Very good. Uh, early house by Frank, pre crazy Frank, but post corporate Frank, sort of influenced by Barna and Court and done on the cheap for Dance at who was the uh, director of the graphic arts department at Shower, which became Howard's. Um, which is, of course, a very influential school now. So Lou uh, requested of uh, Frank that he just kind of do a very simple commercial open space. And that, that organization is kind of two lobes, essentially, that kind of go together. Um, it's, it's something I've just been thinking about for a long time. It's, it's a very simple thing, but it was an effective place to start the project. So I'm going to talk about this just quickly as I flip through. This is Tijuana. For those of you who know, it's a border city that's been kind of beset by a lot of violence in the last 20 years. I was invited by um, a former uh, student of mine, Alfonso Medina, who's an architect and developer, uh, to make a house. The house is based on a five meter uh, module, which is based on your, your CME block uh, construction logic. Everything down there is either block or, or concrete um, or in situ. So we use that basically to structure what's either an H or a V with a bridge between it. There's a plan, the house basically breaks into two lobes or two wings. Um, the one on the bottom is for the parents, so there's a sort of uh, adult side of the house, and then the one on the top is for the kids and the domestic servants, so there's a domestic servant side of the house, 
plus kids. I fought very hard to get the live in made a window. You can see it up there, it's a slot. They were planning for no oxygen, <laughs> but we managed to get a little bit of light in there. Um, upstairs is, is kind of a, on, on the top bar, is a sort of uh, semi symmetrical organization of two rooms for boy and girl. There's a bridge that connects that um, over a camp different stairs, a master bedroom, uh, and a walk in closet and a master bath. So, so it's a very simple building. And it's organized around some fairly um, mundane uh, considerations, like how you do this in six to eight months with a crew of people who work mostly, you know, with their hands using traditional materials. Um, that's the view back to America. So we have a huge wall right there. Did you know that? Huge wall. Huge. Twelve feet tall. Easily. They're going to pay for it. <laughs> I would say, Mr. Trump, why would you do that? Look at this great view of our country you're blocking in. Sorry. <laughs> More people to come in, right? You don't want to leave. You certainly want to put up a fence. You want them to see how great it is in America. So it's, it's an interesting site. It looks up to um, some mountain ranges to the east of San Diego. Julian is there at the peak of the back. And then uh, you can look out to the Pacific. Uh, this is construction porn, so I'll just look through this. All our kids, when they do their first project, like document everything continuously. It's so damn fascinating to see things going up. And then after a while you realize that that's actually what architecture is. It's not that special, but uh, this is a <laughs> blurry lane view. Um, probably, I don't know what state of mind I was in, but that was probably the right state of mind. All right, so the thing came together nicely, and over time it began to fill in. There's just one observation I have here in reference to sort of digital geometry. Uh, one thing that was revealing was discovering that with the most minimal number of moves and, and using essentially orthogonal geometries, you end up producing very unexpected, I think, and at least for me, very unexpected sort of conditions, uh, in particular with uh, regards to how these two things that are kind of skew, how views kind of move through the volumes. And, and some of that stuff on my claim was intentional, and some of it was just accidental. Uh, which is the importance of building, I think, because you can start to see the sort of full experience of your intentions in, in three dimensions, and everybody will tell you, yeah, well, that's what you know, simulations are for, but they're not. Um, view borders were sort of directed. Uh, this is a reference to Bob Irwin. That corner window is a little bit of a lift from a cutout of a museum of contemporary art. And so we got some big openings. Oh, that, that's one. So here you're kind of looking from the inside to the outside to the inside to the outside to the inside to the outside. That's very busting. The inside to the outside. The inside. Uh, and there it is nearly finished. There's a water feature at the front. Uh, that's it on the side of the hill. It's kind of a weird thing. It's, like a, it's a upside down Hollywood Hill type of house because it's on the wrong side of the border and it's facing the north. So as a result, like in LA, the South Bay thing, uh, you know, the facade looks out over the grid. It's, it's solar gain is just huge. The cool thing about working in Tijuana is that you can do a blank south facade to limit solar gain, um, and you can do a very open north facade to get these killer views, and the whole thing ends up being passively uh, heated. You have no air conditioning in it, we use space heaters basically for the kids' rooms and the parents' rooms. Um, the house is completely cross ventilated, so all of the windows, you know, onto the bridge open, and then we have a huge door. Um, uh, which allows for the primary southwest wind that comes off the Pacific to basically produce the Venturi effect. Not the Robert Venturi effect, but the other one. Um, this was an accident. Here, we, a guy discovered that this was all supposed to be white, and then in the process of making it, discovered that leaving the cantilever exposed and um, notching. Uh, to follow the window lines was kind of interesting. So there was a little bit of fudging here. One window actually got moved um, to make it all line up, and that was sort of the nice thing of working um, without some of the constraints that I think are present in North America. And I feel like there was a time, and I'm not being nostalgic, there was a time in, in LA sort of in the 50s and 60s where improvisational construction was possible. We were increasingly sort of, um, it's like a tourniquet, all the regulations we have to deal with. And Ray Cappy told me once that the, for his entire house, they had six sheets of drawings, including structural. And we have six sheets and we haven't even gotten through our general notes. So there, there's something wrong there, too, because you would expect that we're responsible enough to make sure the thing gets uh, properly executed. But one of the beauties of working in Mexico was also the relationship I had with some of the trades and the ability to kind of work things out in the field 
not in a, in a capricious way, but actually in a productive way, which allowed the world to sort of advance. This is an uh, exposed concrete stair, which is this sort of uh, key feature in the house, and it's also the sort of bridge that connects the generations. Um, I, I presented this in San Diego at some well, other college, and some guy raised an arm and said, you know, those cameras are not cool. <laughs> I said, you know, they're Mexican code, so why don't you worry about it? <laughs> um, they're fine. They were approved, they were inspected, and, you know, I think in Mexico people assume that you're responsible enough that if you see a low handrail, you don't fall over it, and if you do, it's probably your problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have other things to worry about, you know, you know, you know, trafficking. So, it's just interesting the sort of paternal and, 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 and punitive culture we operate in as architects, which, you know, continuously puts us in a, you know, in a position of strapping us into, you know, this legal line around the shape of things. So, we're not going to change that, and of course, I think it's important that everybody, regardless of how ably or disabled body they are, has um, fair access to fair environments, but at the end of the day, if you want to leave a rail open in a private house, you should be allowed to. Um, it's kind of, it's odd. But anyway, it looks cool too, right? <laughs> Red's kind of always mess up his character. And when the kids are not, well, when the kids get off the leash, you know, because that's the interesting thing, is what do you do with young people in a house that have really small kids? They could fall to their heads. So, okay, corner window. When I speak of, uh, of uh, some of the features on the site, well, but they won't. And, and here is water feature, which we put in quite late. And then the, the, the majority of these photos now are just, we're done by a professional photographer by the name of Luis Luque, who's a really tremendous young photographer in Mexico City, um, trained as an architect. And so we got it on a cloudy day, which is kind of interesting. And that's the water feature at the front. There's a little bit of a Louis Kahn reference there, and also Barragon, I guess. The door is huge, um, and it pivots, and uh, it, it opens nicely. So, I don't have to say too much more, so let's keep flipping through it, because we got to go as soon as the chapter is off now. Uh, there's the client, Amela. So it ends up being pretty present. But surprisingly, and I hope not too bourgeois, um, one of the major conversations we had was around security, and, and because in Tijuana you are well to do, uh, like your personal safety and security is a legitimate issue. And the primary response to that is part property uh, 
uh, which was unbuildable officially, uh, we got through a conversation on how to do a centralist online project, which has become popular in LA. And I think the broader conversation is about how big a house should be. This house is 1,600 square feet, and it was designed for three generations a grandmother, children, and two parents. Um, they're an immigrant family who, who uh, from Mexico, at least from working on a very tight budget, we did $275,000, pretty nice little prototype of a house. But the parable of the story here is that while it's super efficient in terms of its planning and follows a very basic instructional logic, that was the kind of that was the ambition. Uh, the reality <laughs> is that sometimes people decide to change the paint, put cornice lines on it, and it's very <laughs> This in something called the Three Los Angeles. Christopher Hoffman organized this really interesting conversation around the future of housing in LA. And of course, I, I made this pitch like, look what they did to me. And Chris said, you know, your problem is, like most architects, that you don't realize that you completed the mission that your clients had set you out on, which was to get the thing approved as a kind of new prototype of living on a very narrow lot, um, to bring it in under budget and get it well built. And what you're worried about is that they added things that were meaningful to them culturally. Now, you know, I could say it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a not, that's not inaccurate, but, but I think that what it reveals um, <laughs> is that, you know, the ambition and, and, and execution are, are very different things. I'm still happy with it. I mean, the more I look at it, I should have taken that as the input. It's great. Um, no accounting for taste. So, anyway. Oh, come on. He's a friend. I can say that. <laughs> Um, uh, there was a microbrewery and, and 
and some boutiques and galleries. So sort of a prototypical you know, new age development. Um, but it's all driven essentially around the economics of the parking. And then everything that rides on top of the parking literally or you know, phenomenally has to be pretty light. So we can see that this is a series of very light walls that can be dropped on top of a pretty much standardized parking box. So it's all kind of you know, concrete and concrete block below, and up above is light metal. But that, that stair is a little bit of a reference to Frank's stair at uh, San Juan Place. So that was uh, uh, an opportunity to do a, to, at this point, I think the largest scale commercial project I worked on, um, and it won a couple of awards. Uh, but the, the point is that none of that can happen without actually figuring out where the cheddar, I guess it's how developers put it, the cheddar. The cheddar in the project. And then why do we have any rats, right? Why is there a rat looking for the cheese? <laughs> You're the rat, dude. Um, <laughs> just the rat trap filter. Um, so, anyway, we just came up with a very simple subdivision logic based on parking. Again, there are all these quotidian things you have to learn how to figure out. One of them, of course, is maximum footprint for subterranean parking. Uh, very interested, my partner Paul and I are very interested in automated parking as a way of getting around this problem. But I think one of the great problems in Los Angeles we face or dilemmas and challenges for architecture is having to accommodate parking. Because parking is a thing that almost kills your property. It's expensive to do, it's never occupied, and um, typically, I, I, I believe, it's not aligned with the reality that most people are increasingly not in being court. So I think the legislation now is behind agriculture. So. so we looked at some volumetrics here, came up with a series of modules. You can see some relationship with commercial development, these are all housing modules um, that work off a kind of uh, sectional relationship to the train line, which is submerged. And then a kind of shotgun arrangement here for so-called joint lift work quarters, which is essentially what's happening in Southern California is a lot of blending of living and working, so that's kind of a big thing. So that didn't work. Um, it, it, uh, the economics just didn't pencil out, and I guess the, the site couldn't be divided in such a way that give the housing to a residential developer and the, the public developer, TP, or P3, public-private partnership, to just do the, the retail, so it got canceled. Um, this is the last project that I did, you know, Paul Price was a participant on this project. This may have been why I was partly shown the door. Um, I uh, took on, uh, with the team, the idea of developing a 15-acre site for a major national housing developer in downtown New York's district. Uh, the current architects, Dr. Like Demeron, are, are, um, are moving this project forward as a kind of model. And uh, our approach was to do the opposite, which was not to say one hand, but 15 hands. And so as a result, this is a kind of curation of, of 15 architects starting upper left, uh, let's say left to right, top to bottom. There's an Acom Tower, uh, Monica Ponsiglione, Brooklyn Hurley, and Neil Denari. Uh, Paul Preisner, Kevin Daly, Alfonso Medina, Acom, uh, Patterns, Marcelo Spina, Georgina Holjic, uh, Roger Sherman, Jimenez Lai, uh, uh, Toshi Abi, Edwin Chan, Pentagon, former students at Sire, uh, Andrew Kovacs, and then it goes Jennifer Mormon, Acom, uh, Angie Brooks, and Larry Scarpa, and uh, Acom. So the, the, the reference for this is a project that Charlie Moore did in the 1970s on Bunker Hill. Um, yeah, Ren Kolas wrote a piece on it, which I think Bob actually sent me, called uh, Arthur Harrison versus the LA All-Stars. Um, the winner of this competition to do Bunker Hill was Arthur Harrison, and it these two mega towers adjacent to the Boca development. And the loser was Charlie Moore in France, so and he invited um, Gary Aragon, no, Gary Legoretta, I feel like Davis Brody Bond, a group of architects. And, and what, what Moore said essentially was, I'm not going to master plan the thing. I'm going to conceive of it as a kind of a, like a, like a Hawaiian lei, with a, like a necklace. And, and I'll design the necklace, and you guys put the jewels on it. And it ended up being this very kooky project. Um, so the, the thought was that we could do this and, and, and essentially come up with a kind of, not exactly an exquisite corpse, because none of the projects actually follow each other, uh, either in sequence or terms of certain relationships geometrically uh, along the plan, but rather that, that this kind of collage of different voices could be very productive for two things. One, you would end up with something like urbanism, or an authentic form of urbanism, with multiple voices in a conversation. 
but also that um, it would produce from an investment perspective a way to, let's say, diminish any uh, component of the project from being value engineered out of the pro forma because you essentially could split your risk up into 15 packages. You could entitle them independently, and this is very important, the Hertz X scheme will have to be entitled all at once and that puts them in much more risk. Our thought was that if you could lower the risk, sell each parcel with a different architect, it would guarantee that some percentage of the projects could actually be executed. And I still believe very strongly that this is the right way to do it. I, uh, I think the, the monolithic top-down model produces some pretty horrible type of projects in our cities. And I think architects are more than skilled enough to actually work on uh, the problem of large-scale sites. So it's 15 acres. And you can see here, this is by comparison, uh, the current site has two very long warehouses that are used for food and, and storage, specifically like vegetables and fruit. It's cold storage, but not chilled. Um, and we basically had a quick look at uh, a series of South of Market in San Francisco, Bethesda, Mexico City, the Arts District in Los Angeles, Butler's Wharf in London, the Barigothic in Barcelona, uh, Meatpacking in New York, Shibuya in Tokyo, and San Antonio in, in, in Paris as a way to kind of understand the problem of grain. And we then moved to a conversation about points of entry to the site, so these are probably pretty self explanatory. And then we did very simple exercises where we looked at the number of buildings and the clusters of buildings. So this is something kind of appropriated from Colin Rowe as the sort of ambiguous composite figure. Uh, and then we played a game with the developers where we gave them pieces of black foam and asked them to kind of mass out what they thought would work. Um, and sadly, you know, uh, they didn't stick with it. And uh, they've gone to sort of a single uh, hand solution. And the strange thing for me is that when you get these guys in a room and then, frankly, these are business people, they came up with a better solution than their current architects. I don't think they realize that. Anyway, so then we, you know, once we passed it out, we kind of began the problem of, of personnel out there for Forma. Um, these are some very early sketches just to kind of think through a series of diagonals. And, and they're not literal shapes, but the, there's a notion of this thing being kind of a box of rocks. And if you shake it, the pieces will fall into their appropriate location. Uh, so the urban strategies, again, here we go, uh, 11 football fields. It's pretty enormous. One diagonal that comes through from downtown. One real train loop and one fake train loop. Uh, a series of uh, east-west streets that we put back. These are historic streets that were part of the industrial district in the 1920s and 30s. And they have funny names like wholesale and uh, industrial and um, and one's probably like fruit or something like this, the fruit lane. Which means that this, at, at some point in history, these lanes have specific uh, functions in terms of food distribution in the city. So that was the plan. This is the traffic study that doesn't work. Um, here's a sort of uh, reverse figure round showing a sort of necklace of open spaces that kind of sort of produce the possibility of doing, uh, let's say, like Saturday, you know, food markets. I mean, we have this concept that you can close the whole thing down and fully pedestrianize it, um, so it would actually become quite livable. We parked it, uh, I'll show you the parking diagram in a second in a very unusual way. We also kind of came up with essentially four zones, and the thought was that you could develop from uh, right to left or from east to west. So you do the pieces over on uh, the east side, which are kind of khaki, and um, the pink piece at the top is a, is a hotel by Denari. Those are the closest to the existing arts district, and then you'd work your way west towards um, uh, essentially the rest of the industrial district downtown. This was an idea about mixed programming on the ground floor. What was very important to the developers was that we, we get the mix of construction types right, so we argued. Uh, not for type 5, which is the cheapest and the deepest type of box, um, or for the hybrids 2 and um, 4, but really for 1 and 3. Uh, so we really wanted to push on the idea of making monolithic concrete buildings as much as possible, permanent things with very high floors that could be repurposed later for other uses. And something I believe very strongly in is that current developments tend to sort of uh, straight jacket the architect into very specific construction types, which limit the ability of the building to be later for some other purpose. One of the beautiful things about 19th and 20th century industrial buildings is because they're long span and, and you know, something like this, and you, know, you can reprogram it. And it means that if the investment is right in the architecture, over time it can transform to be used uh, for as yet unpredicted uses. And I think that's what's meaningful about cities that have retained their fabric and grain. Uh, LA has a tendency to turn itself over every 35 years, and that's not ecological. Same. Thank you.
So here are the numbers. We ran all the error calculations, and then we sort of came up with a, a distribution of program. You can see there are two hotels that pin down the corners on the, the northeast and southwest sides. There's a massive uh, residential tower, uh, which we designed quickly. And there's a museum, and then the rest is into the creative office space and, and traditional residential with public parks. Okay. The game was played by giving each architect a very specific brief, so Paul received the brief. I hope that wasn't too arcane, but it was all based on one thesis, which is that you would park the whole thing on one or two surfaces. These are subterranean parking levels, and of course this is heretical, because you're supposed to basically park every building by itself. Ironically, you know, the developers threw this out, but this is what Herzog and Demeron have proposed. Which is why you should not go to this lecture tonight and stay here and, you know, let me finish my presentation. <laughs> um, this is a sort of weird bit of art. I don't know what this is. This is like some drawing that got made. It was supposed to be about hard parking and program, but then it just looked like a cool shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, scripting, love scripting, very fast. The landscape architect got really upset with this. Because, you know, they spent a lot of time like, drawing these like, really complicated kind of you know, stone tiling patterns and adding water by hand. You know, uh, Jordan Squires was like six months out of sight. I was like, just I don't know, come up with something quickly and show these guys the paving pattern. And it kind of, it's fine, you know? And you can probably send it straight to the mill. And nobody will know the difference. Um, this is a little park by Andrew Kovacs. It's a, uh, it's, no, wait, is this what it is? This is Andrew's park to tell him. Um, <laughs> it's a dog and cat park. I know. No, wait, no, this is Menace. You're wrong. <laughs> this is Menace, it's the kids part. And this is Andrew, it's the dog part. Anyway. <laughs> uh, this was the package that went out. Um, they're going to get a look at this. <laughs> so then, basically, everybody got a very specific kind of uh, description of their lot, the dimensions, the kind of FAR, the program, and some deliverables, and hopefully it was a coherent process for you, Paul, I don't know. But probably fine. Uh, it was great. And I think that's what the economies are supposed to do. Uh, Alright, so here the neat thing of course is the, you know, hopefully the success of the project is that you can kind of not see it, in, in at least as a favorite ground on the Charles line, but, but the thought was to make something that could kind of suture itself into the neighborhood and would have some relationship to some of the organizational principles on the ground without doing a full, you know, Congress for New York as a palimpsest. So one thing we did, which was really important uh, for us, was to draw through everything and not to do some kind of neutral, you know, urban planning uh, diagrams. By, by gathering the kind of collective energy of 15 offices, we were able to do, essentially, and the developers were kind of blown away by this, um, we were able to do like a very detailed roof plan, and then here we have, you know, a completely worked out and legitimate uh, ground floor plan with all the cores resolved. Um, openings and, and, and means of egress kind of resolved. And that, of course, was the benefit of working with 15 colleagues, is that you actually can produce stuff that is architecture at the scale of the city. I don't believe in zoning diagrams. I hate maskings. I think you know, we should get into making buildings even at a large scale as quickly as possible because that's what we're trained to do. And so, you know, I don't know if I would call myself an urban designer as much as an architect who is interested in working at the urban scale. And the relationship between that and architecture and the city is very different between, let's say, social policy and planning in the city. And that's something we should be aware of. These are the upper level plans. So this kind of blew them away. And then, this, you know, we did some very quick, I think, semi neutral um, elevation rendering. So here's what you see from left to right Montanari, Orkin O'Hurley, um, Monica Ponsilvian, and Akon. I think the interesting thing that happened as a result of not letting anybody see what their colleagues was were doing was that certain themes actually emerged across the work that were common. So Lorcan and Monica end up strangely with these kind of podiums with towers organized on top of them, which you know ends up being a, a perfectly interesting solution. And they were never in conversation with each other. So when we actually revealed the model and all the architects saw the work, it was fascinating to sort of see the tendencies. So for instance, I'm gonna just point some of these out. Um, uh, daily Architects and, and Larry Stark both ended up one with kind of long linear organizations. Uh, 
um, Hitoshi and, and Edwin Chan, formerly of Frank Gehry Associates, end up with these strangely crenellated things next to each other. They were just, again, you can sort of, just, you can sort of start to see certain uh, tendencies emerging, like both what Roger Sherman and my and Morgan and the family. Um, so, and, and patterns and, and uh, prize architects actually end up producing essentially the same diagram, even though they're kind of radically close to each other and don't talk and hate each other very much. <laughs> um, all right, so we had a guy in the office who worked for the Arctic for one summer, and this is the only kind of one he could do. <laughs> Which is pretty interesting. I don't know what happens to the brain. But... <laughs> they're good. They're, they're nice. I mean, they actually demonstrate that this thing potentially could work, you know, as an urban environment. Okay, so we're almost done, believe it or not. Um, this is a night shot looking back at the city. And what I like here is you can see the uh, the six street axis becomes kind of a you know organizing principle for the site. And the tower which we designed was really intended to have a rotational relationship to these two axes. Sits back to the city and then Allen Gate, which connects Union Station and 10 freeway down here. Um, so that was fun. But okay, so here are the architects, so I'll just I'm gonna just go through these. it was a really great exercise and I would love to do it again. I think that there is great value in working with colleagues and having conversations that extend outside of your you know your personal interests. And I've always believed that um, the value of being an architect is in being conversation with others, not working alone. So for me, this this is a very meaningful thing to do, and, and hopefully, it's one that will make me lots of money one day. Um, I'm kidding, <laughs> but you, you got to think that sometimes, right? Maybe not. Okay. So this is Alfonso Medina. He did a kind of weird, uh, an interesting, I think, take on the OMA uh, Rotterdam City Hall project. Marcelo Tortina, Dr. Sherman, who you guys know. There he is, and then his live. Tushki. Edwin, these just take a long time to load. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Edwin did a really beautiful project. He, 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 this guy is incredibly talented, obviously. You're Frank's partner for 27 years. You're very fast. He did this in an afternoon on a fan saw. Um, and drew it uh, the next morning. He took an Ellsworth, I mean, it's a very interesting thing he did. He took an Ellsworth Kelly drawing of the, the three petals and he just extruded it. And he cut that out of foam and he just placed it on, on a very simple block and then he added these kind of bubbly little lobbies below. And I have to say, that was literally one of the most talented people I've ever had the opportunity to work with. He's just incredibly fast, on, fast and smart. He gets it right the first time, which is not so easy. Andrew's been working on this project. He actually developed a really beautiful model for Sean uh, this summer. I mean, for Sean this spring. That's Jennifer Mormon, uh, graduate of Alumna, graduate of Sire, doing some very interesting work, platform for architecture and research, and, uh, and uh, Angie in there. So, okay. Oh, and then I've got to show you the economic stuff, but quickly. Museum, housing, see the Arca. This is the Bjarke guy. This is what you got. <laughs> Uh, Dutch guy. Uh, basically, we parceled out the projects in the office so the younger designers could you know, each work on or collaborate on a piece together, um, which was a sort of expedient way to make our own kind of placeholders while trying to coordinate um, all the other architects. So, the, the 3D printed model ends up being probably, I think, the most evocative thing and, and maybe the most powerful statement for the kind of right scale of the grain. The tower is obviously one segment too tall. Um, we spent some time in a doctor in these photographs in Photoshop. That's a cute little reference to uh, Mr. Louis Kahn. So that's that project. There it is. Sunset. Wouldn't that be great? Imagine that. <laughs> so nice. Got that yellow blade on the Okay, now in the next. Jesus. When did we start? After it's almost an hour and 50 minutes left. What? We started at 2.30. But realistically, I think we started at 5 minutes. So we're into this about an hour. So I can do this in 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. Who wants to stay? If you want to leave, leave now. You're missing the hurt so I can get by. Let us know how, how the talk goes. Take the skateboard. It's going to take you about 20 minutes to get to IT. If you go really fast, just get a tow from an Uber. All right, call back. Let us know. Say hi to Jack.
<laughs> or Jack, as I like to call him, Jack Herzog. <laughs> My coffee buddy. Um, all right, so uh, so here's the this is the conclusion, and hopefully this is the payoff. Um, Paul and I have been at this with one very heroic employee for only six months. We have just finally put all the work together today, and, and it's it's beginning to have a voice, which is interesting. It's um it's an interesting thing to come at starting to practice again after having done it a few times. And both Paul and I have you know experience in a lot of different work environments, so. Um, while we think we know what we're doing, it's just as hard as doing anything else. And, and I, I think that, um, you know, I'm very grateful for Paul because he's an extremely experienced fellow. And I tend to kind of delight over things, and, and Paul does. And so we're kind of we're learning how to be partners, which is wonderful. And I, I'm hopeful that it makes a better architecture. We certainly have the same objectives, and uh, we have very different skill sets. So hopefully that'll, that'll be meaningful in a year if we start building. So the first thing we actually got to do, um, which was interesting, was the first commission was actually like a lighting setup for some total. Uh, they're an Austrian, uh, you know, LED lighting company that I met through Acom, and they approached us to reconceive or reconceptualize uh, a, a, a standard industrial lighting track that they, that they made called the Tecom. So. This is part of the sort of spiel, you know, in which we try to sort of talk to them about our interests in art and technology. And then we give a very weird presentation to, to uh, their board and also some of their design guys who are really design engineers. I'm not sure how it went down because we didn't really present in a traditional way, so we started by showing, you know, the origin of the Tecton here, uh, Maledich. Um, and then we worked through things that we thought were meaningful to us, and in particular, maybe around art and specific art made with light. Um, you guys know Dan Flavin, so I, I will not spend too much time here on these kind of quotes, but it was a sort of weird way of doing kind of a corporate presentation in which you show references, but we didn't show the references you would normally show, the ones you're supposed to show. And so we tried to turn uh, the conversation with the clients into, um, and maybe a little bit of an esoteric conversation, but it sort of moved the dial, as we say, um, to the left where we wanted it. Uh, and we really wanted to specifically attack their idea about what it meant to be futuristic and advanced. And I love this quote by Carl Andre, which he says, what is abandoned is more of a challenge than what's just been discovered. So then we wrote a lot of little manifestos, which we kind of bombarded them with. We kept talking about emancipation uh, and the American project of technology, but the same to the ones of J.G. Ballard and Foucault. <laughs> so, I mean, imagine you've got a bunch of pretty, you know, uh, high-powered Austrian business guys in a room, and, and you're talking about the code. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting approach, you know, and, and, and it ended up being a much more open conversation. Of course, we got thrown out of the process, but, but, um, but nonetheless, I think we said what we wanted to say in the context of, of being asked to design um, a set of lights, which, you know, most architects don't do. So, that's the tech talk, and we just tried to figure out, we learned a lot about how kind of electronic was, we learned a lot about, about essentially electrical engineering. And uh, of course, they have housing, which is basically metal that is going to crimp and, and extruded uh, robotically. And we started asking questions about whether or not we could lighten the thing, make the profile more elegant, uh, and then. So that's what we ended up with, which is a kind of double barrel shotgun. Uh, carbon fiber, which would have to be protruded, apparently. And we ran through a whole series of exercises in which we were trying to find out if there was an optimal profile that we were happy with. Um, and some of us made us press the thumb, which was kind of odd for them because they like using real heavy materials. Um, and that's how, the, that's how the LED lighting track kind of pops in. And then part of the thesis was that in addition to giving light, and, and we, we didn't just answer that question, we said, what if this system, which is so, you know, ubiquitous in, in all our environments, whether it's a supermarket or a hospital or industrial building, could do other things. So we said you could put a speaker on it or a spotlight or a router or a projector. And, if, you know, and we moved all of this, this shit making into kind of an abstract language that we thought was a little bit more artful and less industrial design. And we didn't get the job. So um, the next thing we got asked to do was, but if we have time, I'll show you a very nice video we did for the pitch. Um, 
Um, the next thing we got asked to do is a very minor project, but it's one that we're very excited about. This is Lumber Park. It's a traditionally African-American community in Los Angeles, which was designed by the Olmsted Brothers in uh, the 1920s. Here you see it in 1933. It's just west of USC, and you can see the distance of water down, which is pretty cool. Uh, of course, by the 1990s, Lumber Park, like other parts of South Los Angeles, was um, a fairly freighted and fraught environment. It's come back. Um, this is a Sunday festival at, at the square. Mark Bradford, who's a tremendous Los Angeles uh, artist, has a space there. He's designed with, um, with LACMA. It's called Art and Practice. And so our clients are, are from the community. Um, they approached us uh, basically to come up with a coffee shop concept, which they intend to have rolled out. What's really interesting about um, the site is that you have here the, you have the Olmsted Brothers. I mean, it's really the only Keats of the Olmsted Planet of Los Angeles. And it's a very interesting plan because it's kind of double and triple layered. Um, it has walk streets and it offers an alternate vision of what LA could have been. It's, of course, it's done in a kind of Spanish language, but in particular, what you should focus on is the kind of walkability of, of the neighborhood. Here, south of Vernon, you see basically you know, um, alternate kind of suburban tracks, which are you know, more typical for Los Angeles. But the property is here, and it sits strangely on a little walk street, which is gated right now, which was meant to get folks living in this kind of uh, duplex and quadplex and triplex environment onto this commercial corridor. This is the building that we're currently converting. The program is for a um, branded uh, uh, coffee, which is essentially a, a, it's a coffee concept called Izzy. Um, Izzy means here in, I feel like Aramaic, but I could be wrong. But in any case, it, yeah, I think it means like you are here. And uh, one of our clients is uh, Ethiopian, and the other is Jamaican, and the other is um, Japanese, African American. So they're a very interesting group of people to work with. But what we're sort of interested in specifically is the is the idea that the the, the program which would become a new social hub in the neighborhood. One half of of the, of the box, which is from 1927, is a dedicated uh, coffee shop with, you know, like food service, and the other is a, is a lifestyle store concept that will um, sell uh, basically domestic products to the community. Uh, and then across the street, the goal is to do an organic um, local market and garden. So as you know, in a lot of uh, inner city neighborhoods in America, this is a food desert. So you have to drive either to USC or on the back of Culver City to get a decent so to do this is, I think, very meaningful in this neighborhood, but in particular the back, what we're working on is a garden, which will connect the walk street through back up to the Olmsted plan. And this will be a kind of communal garden that we use for art events and activities. So it's a kind of very forward thinking and maybe a little bit of an idealistic project, and it's being done on a very small budget. Um, there isn't really much architecture to show here yet. We've basically just laid out um, you know, good coffee service. And, and ADA, and we're working on some very simple profiles. The hope is that we're going to do the, the bar service and then continuously cast concrete bench, um, which will be kind of a monolith in the space, and the rest of it is just dry wall paint. Um, so it's a modest project, but, but it's one we're really excited to be involved with. And if it works, it's going to get pulled down all over Los Angeles. Uh, the next commission we got through that point uh, was for a beach house in. Um, in Mission Beach, which is in San Diego, where I grew up. And so this one's very close to my heart because I used to serve in front of this site. Uh, the references here are pretty obvious. The Schindler uh, Level Health House in Newport Beach is a, is a pretty interesting and classic uh, triple level um, concrete frame uh, aquatic marine environment, I suppose. Uh, this is Schindler's own, uh, so come back in a second, El Pueblo Rivera Port, also in San Diego, at Winton Sea. This was done at the same time Schindler was doing his own house. And then this one you may know. So I put actually at the bottom there, you can see who did these, but for those of you who can't see, that's Louis Baradon. That's the Casa de Lardy in Mexico City. Also very interested in the sort of work that Charles Moore did um, at Seaside in the 70s. And you know the usual California the cliches of indoor outdoor. And finally, as a way of thinking about how to wrap up, uh, I mean, if you get the, the, the gist here is it's a wooden box next to the beach. It will weather over time, and uh, we'd like to find a way to um, 
development planning team that is in the standard. So friends tell us uh, black paintings are a good news to us. And strangely, they have something to do with the uh, plan uh, of the uh, Steam Ranch Tennis Facility by Charles Moore. So this, of course, is the worst form of like art criticism. This is like Clement Greenberg saying, is like this, is like this, is the same thing. But you know, I think it's a it's a corrective way to work sometimes. So I, you know, part of this, these are things that we show to clients. And while you know, you may kind of you know uh, wrinkle your nose or kind of cringe at the idea of being this obvious, um, having these conversations at the beginning of a project with a client about our, our references and our interests is very important to us because it sets the tone for our ambitions. And I think it kind of, you know, obviously. It allows the conversation to move beyond budget and schedule, and um, and without sounding condescending, uh, it's a way to educate your client to your own ambitions. I think that's very important. You know, we want to elevate the conversation as quickly as possible out of the usual kind of routine, you know, matters that small projects demand. Of us. So there are three very simple approaches. One is to staff it. We're going through the Coastal Commission right now, so we're just working on sort of basic law metrics. The subject of what is too big or too small in the neighborhood is of interest to us. Um, there's a bar about reference. We're going to park it underneath the cantilever, we think. And then you have a series of, of decks that kind of cascade um, towards uh, key views to the Pacific Ocean. And it's the last one which got thrown out. Just kind of shenanigans. So, you know, these are sort of typical quick things we run through. Um, one thing that's very important to us is the subject of kind of how the thing is viewed and what the thing looks at. So the red kind of cone of vision, of course, is the is the value of the property, which is to capture a kind of clear shot of the Pacific. But then it situates itself in a very interesting neighborhood. So for those of you who've been in California, you have all these little beachline communities that are kind of smushed up against the Pacific, and they're very interesting because they have walk streets. And, and the, the, the vehicular kind of loading is at the back, so it goes alley, walk street, alley, walk street, alley, walk street. It's all pedestrianized, people skateboard and ride their bikes, and then it's all kind of condensed next to something called boardwalk. So it produces these very intimate conditions. Um, our client has kind of pointed out that she, she feels that it has a, uh, a fine grained urban texturality, that's what she said to us. And she's a really interesting woman, she's a fashion designer, so a lot of her language around how she sees the project as she talks about fabric literally and we talk about grain and pattern. Um, and hence, you know, the conversation around how to plan it uh, is, is meaningful. But what I'm fascinated with is the kind of uh, the architecture that emerged in this area because it was sort of like a beach type holiday uh, community in the 20s and 30s. And so you can sort of see this for sort of smaller scale, little individual boxes and objects. And then, of course, you get into the 1970s and 80s monstrosities that make it impossible to see the ocean. And have it almost like, you know, if you've been to, to Tokyo, if you've been to Shibuya or, or um, Karajuku. When I went to Japan for the first time, Tokyo reminded me of Mission Beach when I grew up, which is very strange, you know, to think of a suburban site. And I never understood why until I actually started to think about the density and the scale and the size of the objects in the field and how you kind of move through them. So this is a, this is a classic level. Here. So, as a, just as a way of kind of analyzing the site, the, the dark blue is the kind of band is the Pacific, the, the light blue band is the bay, so it's on an isthmus, isthmus, and then there is a kind of network, so here you see um, basically you know, walkways, Mission Boulevard, which is major north-south, you know, uh, four-lane um, boulevard, and then the kind of uh, alleys that kind of pass through and around. This gives you this kind of very strange diagram to work in. And our project is kind of situated right here, at, you know, at, at, at the you know at the front base is on a, it's on this kind of little pedestrian walkway that takes you from the bay to the beach. So people go back and forth all the time. And their boats kind of dock here, like small catamarans and whatnot. And then of course you've got the boardwalk, which you know for those of you who know Southern California is kind of the locus of a lot of kind of leisure activity, jogging, running, rollerblading watching people. Um, and then the alley network, which you know is basically how people kind of park and deliver things. So it's a, it's we're interested in taking this kind of textural fabric and beginning to press it down and start to, to, to format the house. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but, but we're 
thinking about the internal organization of the house is being tied into this kind of urban network, which is maybe a little lofty, but. Uh, same client then invited us to consider renovating one of the Schindler houses on the Moya. Um, Schindler's a very interesting character because, you know, the, the, in the popular mythology, he is kind of the anti neutra in Southern California. He's this loose bohemian character who makes his work on site. We have basically been going through the archives at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and we've discovered a treasure trove of letters, the contractor letters, the client lists. So he, you know, writes these very detailed spreadsheets, and it says, like, you know, dear Mr. Miller, please attach an invoice for eight bags of concrete, 24 sheets of cello text, um, and, please, and here's a schedule for delivery and installation. He's talking with the GC. And, and the drawings are incredibly annotated. Um, they're not loose at all, which, is, which was fascinating for us to discover. And what we really identified is that the whole thing sits within a kind of a framework, which is a, it's a standardized construction module. It's four by four. So we started running these kind of analytical drawings as a way of understanding how he drew. So these are our, our we've traced over Schindler's drawings because the house had been basically um, partially demolished and then renovated by a series of other owners. And it, it, it's very hard to find what is original in the house right now. So we're doing a little bit of work to kind of get back to the original plan. Um, at the bottom here, there's a garden, which you kind of lined with a hedge. There are sort of a row of concrete setting pads that take you into the kitchen on the left. Downstairs, uh, you know, has a sort of covered porch. That's a living area, a bathroom, and a bedroom. And then upstairs, we have um, what is now covered, but what originally used to be an open sleeping lot. So if you know the Kings Road house, Schindler's idea was that if you were in California, you actually slept outside at night. And so over time, people started to fill in this loft, so it's now enclosed. Our um, brief is to fix the house, to improve the kitchen, restore it, and then our, the thesis we have, as we started to kind of draw through it, is that uh, rather than attempting to do uh, a renovation, since we're not historic preservationists, we're going to get the shell and the significant components, which we can define as Schindler's original work, back to their original state. And then we are going to ask the kind of question, which is what would Schindler do today? And our answer is basically to generate a field of new objects that don't touch the shell. So we're designing a series of several standalone pieces, um, a bathtub, a uh, new kind of kitchen work counter, and uh, a banquette, um, and eventually an addition to both of them, the backside, uh, maybe in a new language. Uh, you're not allowed to touch anything that's on the street. It's historically preserved, but there's nothing in um, basically what has to say that they're not visible from the street. And we've been documenting a series of additions that Schindler himself did right up until about the 1950s, where he placed very loosely inside of this red framework of um, proportions and, and uh, kind of structural grid. So that's that's a kind of unformed project. This is the last project I'm going to show you, and then we're done. Uh, this is a 350,000 square foot adaptive relief project in uh, downtown Los Angeles. Over here is Sire. So this, if you come to LA, this is where where Peach and uh, this here is six Street. So this was the site for the uh, A Mile Master Plan. This is the immediately uh, eastern building. It's a 19, uh, 1920s, early 30s uh, concrete uh, warehouse. Massive building, all concrete. It's engineered for 300 pounds a square foot. But um, it was originally, I think, intended for very large industrial machines. Uh, it has 12 foot ceiling. And this is the new Sixth Street Bridge by Michael Lawson, which we'll see in a second. Um, so, our brief here was to think about what to do on the roof. The owners have a door factory there. They've come to the conclusion that they can move their door factory to a new retail distribution center, probably somewhere south and east of here. And the highest and best use for the site now is what's called joint live working quarters. Um, plus, the city's asking for a kind of art function, so there may be a gallery in it. Uh, Jimmy Parkhurst is a young designer and photographer, a fashion designer, a graphic designer who did our logo. We commissioned him to do a series of photographs um, from the building looking at the site. There's the Sixth Street Bridge. <coughs> That's the view from the roof back to downtown. This is a view along Mill, which runs up to Sixth. Um, so you can see it's a really handsome building, and um, the architects who were previously engaged to do this decided to clad the whole thing in this kind of bright form of metal panels that look ridiculous in the city through them out. So we've been trying to think about a way to essentially do a crown on the building, 
while preserving, um, you know, what essentially is uh, uh, an artifact at this point. So we're going to leave the shell alone. We're going to leave most of the first six floors alone. And we're going to build on the roof and rather than swallow that water tower, which we think is very beautiful, we're going to try to find a new use for it. Okay, and this is just sort of standard stuff we said that we do for the client, which is figure out how to do maximum as of right site planning, figure out how to do parking, do a green rooftop space, and figure out how to make you know, units on the roof that are attuned to the environment. Um, this is kind of the typical land use kind of uh, work we're doing right now, where we're trying to figure out what's there uh, and what could be there. And we're going through a very arcane process with a group called Kendall Gang and their lobbyists to kind of understand how to read code. And uh, we've come up with a magic number, which is about 40,000 square feet of additional space that we can do as of right without having to go through a zoning administrator's uh, interpretation, which is a very nasty kind of um, and long and arduous political process that could lead in uh, the wrong direction, which is a no from the city. So part of the work that we're trying to do right now is just to get the entitlement process, the political process, and the performative work for our clients who are not developers. They're, they're our Persian uh, door makers, and they're really not in the real estate business, so this is a new idea for them. And at the same time, we're trying to lead them to some solutions that will give them um, not only amenities, but some, some assets that they can use to develop the rest of the site, which is five acres. So we're pushing hard on automated parking. We want to do a parking battery there. We also want to get the building to net zero, which is going to be a challenge, but we're working on it. So here you got the roof. We got uh, almost 40,000 square feet to play with up there. We ran uh, essentially our own kind of pro forma after having to rewrite the code 15 different times, and then our higher consultants explained it to us again. In LA, there's something called the shadow code, which is there's what's on the books and there's what you can do behind the scenes. And it's, it's a little problematic because you really never can tell the client what they can actually do. Part of it is kind of figuring out the path through this really arcane and esoteric process. It's like you know being like a Talmudic scholar. You, know, you either you know how to read the old you know, rules or you don't. And so, um, so the concept's very simple. It's a cliche in a way, but, but we think it's powerful. We, we think that the most interesting thing about Los Angeles is that um, it has a history of great single family residential architecture and great, you know, roof, uh, great green spaces. And that to do a kind of New York style penthouse makes absolutely no sense given the weather and the climate and the fact that you can be outdoors most of the year. So the touchdown, of course, is, is Case Study House 22. Um, you know, we do this stuff not because the intention is to make case study work. It's really to kind of get our clients to know this project very well because it exists in the popular imagination as valid in Los Angeles so we can move on from kind of historical reference as quickly as possible, even though this is a historical reference. Um, and, you know, we talk about things that are aspirational. So this is a rooftop garden in, in uh, New Fosh, near the Arctic Spoons. And just the only observation we have about Los Angeles is that you know most great old cities have great rooftop gardens. The Metropolitan has this wonderful installation by Dan Graham, and LA basically just has air conditioning you know, and the units on the roof. So we don't take advantage in LA of being up because we're not an urban city. People are down on the ground, and our belief is that if we're making a rooftop project, it has to or should at least compete with what other world cities would see as what you do when you run out of space on the ground. And there's a history of this. Of course, it's on the ground. This is Greg Green and, and Gary Ekbo. Um, they're planning for Mar Vista, which was a fully integrated green uh, environment, which is an kind of alternate Los Angeles, not a kind of track driven Los Angeles, but one driven by uh, sort of machines and gardens. Um, so that's kind of where we got with, with the client. There's the site, so you can sort of see where we are relative to the city. There's Michael's Bridge. We own the only bootleg version of the geometry of that bridge. Uh, outside of Michael's office, not going to get arrested for saying this. We asked for the geometry and we were told that there was like some homeland security um, issue. <laughs> so we rebuilt the model off of all the photographs we found online um, by image management. But the thing is pretty accurate, we might try to sell it back to them. Because <laughs> we built some pretty detailed models, right? So, okay. Very quickly, uh, here, we didn't want to do this. This is typical kind of LA you know, rooftop development. This is called luxury. This is an abomination. Why would you want to be 150 foot long, 200 foot long, double loaded corridor with no natural light? Um, that's our thesis. And uh, the demonstration really is to ring the middle 
with a series of different unit types and then to leave the tower free, not to swallow it. So we start with a simple location of the lobby, two fire stairs. This is all code driven. Uh, outdoor single loaded corridors that face onto a garden, and then a variety of unit types that then provide for market rate. None of this is affordable, to be honest with you. It's all luxury, but it is what it is. Uh, and we try to produce a series of interstitial um, conditions with your gardens and, and pools um, so that you don't end up with the sort of notion of, of the rooftop just being an additional floor, but rather our goal is to crane into place a series of partially fabricated units. Um, we'll talk about materiality in a minute. Uh, and then, of course, most importantly, we're hitting our, our FAR, which is crucial for us, and this is the most you know, rewarding aspect of this conversation with the clients because they're really just trying to figure out how to, to meet market rate um, value, is that we are within 800 feet of our as of right FAR mass, but we're still providing 6,000 square feet of green. And then there's the automated parking facility down below, which has a kind of, uh, has a kind of nibbled away green edge and a, and a lap pool that, well, it's actually a big pool that sits on top of an automated parking box. Oops, sorry. And so conceptually, um, and this sounds a little uh, ambitious, we intend to build all of the units out of electronic glass, so the kind of glass that OMA used in the cloud store. Uh, we'll use that to control uh, heat gain, we'll also use it to deliver privacy. So the, the idea of a bunch of sort of jello cubes on the roof is where we're headed right now. Uh, we think it produces a kind of alternate skyline conversation with the city and um, updates the sort of case of the project, which would you know, glass houses, but I'm not sure if we could get transparent roofs, but that would be the hope. So these are very preliminary, they literally are kind of presented two days ago to the client, but um, it's the first evidence of what the thing could be. Uh, obviously, it's a lot of my team, but this is what we're kind of getting with it as a conceptual gesture. Um, and right now, we're trying to, you know, we're being driven right now to, we've got 15 units, we're 16 units currently, the clients have come back and said 24. So the stock is going to start moving to more of a three-story <coughs> area. So we're thinking a lot about houses by Sana or or Atelier Bow Wow, so that the, 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 the sort of footprint to sectional proportions shift. As we go up, we gain more view. Um, they will all be partially fabricated on site. Our offer to the to the owners is that rather than go through the arduous task of you know field building this project, we're going to actually attempt as much as possible not to do prefabrication because we're not interested in that kind of voice. But to get this thing, you know, uh, built and occupied within six months of, of uh, receipt of the permit from the city. So that's where we got. Um, thank you. I have some videos, but I think it's a little late. Maybe we just say no more questions. Let's go party with Jack Herzog. We could all show up on mats right now. Although I bet he finished early. He's probably done. So that's it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for enduring 415 slides.
That's it? What are they serving if they're excited that we're on? Last year, we can get all the drinks. We could show up like drunks of the week. I should have said that. <laughs> Maybe the wedding, wedding crashers. What? We're still tasting. You can edit this out. Like wedding crashers. Like all of this just go on mass. But that's the end of it. Paul, come on, man. Give me something. Just got one. It creates the opportunity for a lot of um, miscommunication. 